Hello everyone, welcome to Lukman IS. Today we are going to have the Hindu newspaper analysis dated 21st of October 2023. In today's newspaper analysis, we are going to cover a mapping topic and then we are going to cover the articles from the newspaper. So let us quickly have a look on the articles that we are going to cover in today's session. So these are the list of articles that we are going to cover. Okay. Name of the articles are mentioned over here and their page number is mentioned and also from which section of the syllabus these articles are relevant we have also mentioned. For example, the first topic is rivers in Southeast Asia. It is a geography and mapping topic so it will be important for the prelims exam. Similarly, if you see other topics so their relevant thing is mentioned. It will help you to let's say like map like which section of the syllabus is these are these topics related to. So the first topic that we are going to cover today is rivers in Southeast Asia, right? So rivers in Southeast Asia, why it is important? Because Southeast Asian nations have been in news and we have already seen the political aspect of Southeast Asian nation. So Southeast Asia, uh, like you know, as part of ASEAN, there are 10 countries that are member of it. However, many other countries also have influence over the Southeast Asian nation, I mean like ASEAN. And many countries are observers also. India is an observer of ASEAN, okay? So that's why today we are going to look into this topic from a uh, like physical point of view to understand about the rivers that flows through it, okay? So as we know, if we talk about India, right? Through India, many important rivers flow. So one of the river is Indus River, right? It, let's say, originates in Tibetan Plateau, so it originates somewhere in Tibet, then it flows through India and goes to Pakistan. Indus River is, let's say, an important river system for us. It has been in news also recently for many reasons. I mean, like, you know, there have been dispute between India and Pakistan related to, like, sharing of water in the Indus River system. So we do have an Indus Treaty also, Indus River Water Treaty. That treaty was signed in 1960 and it was brokered or like mediated by the World Bank, right? So related to that Indus River, Indus River system was in news. And this Satlaj River, it is also considered to be a part of the Indus River system itself. Then another important river that flows through India is Ganges River or Ganga River, right? So Ganga River also orig originates here. It flows through most of the part of the, let's say, northeastern India, like, you know, northern part of India, and then it, it goes towards the eastern side as well. It finally, let's say, drains its water into the Bay of Bengal region, right? This is the thing. So apart from this, there are some rivers that originate in Nepal. It flows through Nepal to India. One of the river is Kosi River. This Kosi River is also known as Sorrow of Bihar. I mean, like, you know, it flows from Nepal through Bihar to India. And like, you know, this river sometimes brings floods with it. That's why it is also known as Sorrow of Bihar like that. Okay, then uh, there are other rivers as well. Then if we talk about this river, which is known as Yarlung Sangpo. Okay, this is known as Yarlung, Y-A-R-L-U-N-G, Yarlung. Sangpo. So this Yarlung Sangpo, it originates in China. It originates in the, let's say like in the Kailash mountains and it flows through China to India and then it flows through Bangladesh to the Bay of Bengal region. This is also one of the largest river, among the largest rivers that flows through India. Means like Ganga, then Brahmaputra. Brahmaputra is also one of the largest river. So Brahmaputra is a river, I mean like, you know, its main river is Yarlung Sangpo. From Yarlung Sangpo, when it enters into India, then it is known as Brahmaputra, okay? So like the place where it enters in India, it is like Arunachal Pradesh. So we have Dihang, Dibang. So these are tributaries of Brahmaputra river. Then to the east part also, if we go to the eastern portion, to India. So we see another river which is known as Irrawaddy. Okay, name of the river is Irrawaddy River. This river originates in the Tibetan Plateau in China. Then it flows through Myanmar to the Bay of Bengal region. You might have heard about the name of dolphins, Irrawaddy dolphins. Okay, so Irrawaddy dolphins, you need to see what is the IUCN status of Irrawaddy dolphins. That's also important. So having understood this, now let us see another river which is Salween River. 
Salwin River also originates in China in the Tibetan Plateau and it flows through, let's say like, you know, Myanmar. It flows through Myanmar and, and finally it, it goes to the Bay of Bengal region. Then we have this Mekong River. Mekong River is a very important river because this river flows through many countries in the Southeast Asian region, okay? It flows through, let's say like, you know, when it, it, it comes from China, then it flows through uh, like these countries. One of the countries is Laos, right? Other countries uh, like, does it flow through Vietnam? Yes, it flows through Vietnam. Also, it flows through Cambodia, right? Because Vietnam has over here, right? It flows through Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam and all. It goes parallel to Thailand like that. So we do have a cooperation, I mean like, you know, regional group, which is known as Mekong Ganga co uh, Cooperation, right? You might have heard about it, Mekong Ganga Cooperation. So that cooperation has been in news. So this name of the cooperation is, let's say like, you know, they try to build civilizational ties between countries. I mean like, you know, between the Southeast Asian countries and India. Why civilizational ties? Because historically, if we see the, uh, let's say, past of India, there have been many people from China who have visited in India. For example, you might have heard about Hyun Sang, Fa Hin. They have not only been travelers to India, but they have also written let's say like you know their account of travel to India and those books are widely referred to by people right uh, to understand about the historical past of India when we re-account the historical past of India we also go through let's say like you know the uh, accounts of the foreign travelers we go through let's say many other sources of also to recreate the past so this is the thing okay so that's why Mekong Ganga cooperation is also important then we have this another river which is Yangtze River, okay. This Yangtze River, it originates in China, then through China, let's say like, you know, it, it flows to over here. I mean like, you know, this is Shanghai, so it flows uh, to the, let's say like, you know, not South China Sea, but over here to the east of it, right. So we have already mapped South China Sea in our pre previous discussion. Apart from this, we have another river which is known as Pearl River, okay, it is Pearl ri River. It enti entirely originates in China and finally flows into the South China Sea. Yes. It is also important for us to remember the name of this river because South China Sea is a disputed region, is a disputed territory. So it is important that we remember the rivers also that flows to the South China Sea. Many a times, since we do not look into these aspects, UPSC may ask a question and we may fail to answer them. So you need to have an atlas with you all the time the atlas, like world atlas, for example, uh, like I generally recommend people to st study either one of the atlas. One is Orient Black Swan Atlas or Oxford Student Atlas. I mean like any one of the atlas you should be having with you so that you understand. Means like through these topics I make you understand means like what are the important things that we need to read, yes. right, as part of the mapping thing. So in your free time you download this. Also correlated with the map that you have, let's say world map that you may be having, physical map of the world or atlas. So that way you'll be able to remember the things, okay? So having understood this, now let us quickly move to the first topic of the day. Name of the topic is the politics of a caste census, its impact, on sec uh, its impact of secularism, right? So let us discuss about this topic. What is the name of the topic? The the politics of a caste census. It's on secularism. So let's understand about this, right, politics of caste census and its impact on secularism. So the heading itself talks about many important things, right, related to the constitution of India, related to Indian polity and the society of India. For example, if we talk about caste, caste is a concept and this caste, I mean like, you know, this has originated in Indian subcontinent, it is a, let's say, like, you know, concept that has originated in our history, right? If we go, to, uh, go through ancient history, so we understand the Varna system. Varna system means the Varna system was originated 
in the Manu Smriti. Where? In like Manu Smriti. Okay. It has originated in Manu Smriti. So as part of the Varna system, we used to have what? The Brahmins. We used to have Brahmins. Then we had Kshatriyas. We had Vaishyas. And we had Shudras. Right? So the society was divided into four different Varnas. Varna means caste. Okay, Varna means caste. Varna is a Sanskrit word. Right? It means caste. So the caste was decided based on the occupation that people used to do. I am mean, like people who were into the service field, I mean the Brahmins. So they were not doing into any manual work. So they were the people who were advisors of the kings, who were advisors of the rulers. They used to perform sacrificial activities, right, for the rulers, so that rulers can win, they can, let's say, reign over the clan and all. So that's why the Brahmins were considered to be the topmost class in the society, right? So they had the highest status in the society in our ancient India. Then we had Kshatriyas. Kshatriyas were those people who were warrior class, like the kings and uh, let's say people who were fighting for the kings and all, who were into the administration generally. So they were the Kshatriyas. Then we had Vaishyas, okay? Vaishyas were those people who were into the trading activities. They were traders. And Shudras were the people, lower caste people. I mean, like these people were involved in, uh, you know, doing service to the people. They were into the cleaning uh, thing. They were, let's say, like lower level operations, the uh, kind of operation that nowadays the group D employees do in, in government services and all like that. Okay. So the Varna system, it has its roots in the historical past. It has its roots in the Indian society, right, in the historical past. So we see the Varna system over there and the Varna system wo is mentioned, let's say, as part of the Vedas also. So we do find it's mentioned in the Vedas and Vedas have been written by whom? By the Brahmins, by the upper caste people. So they wanted to maintain their dominance and that's why they have put themselves on the top, right? They, they have put themselves on the top. So we find the Varna system in the Manusmriti, right? Manusmriti was a kind of codified law book, that's the thing. And since past till today, India is an independent nation. So in 1947, we became independent. But even after independence, most of the people who were the lower caste people, they were subjugated in the past. They are being subjugated now. I mean, like, you know, their status in the society has not improved. So that's why government of India has come up with one important, let's say, reform into the constitutional structure itself that is known as providing reservation to the people. Reservation, like we use the word reservation, but if we talk about elsewhere in the world, they say it to be affirmative action, okay? They say it to be what? Affirmative action. So what are affirmative actions? Affirmative actions are the, let's say, reservation policies of different, uh, uh, like, you know, in different countries. Reservations are given to lower caste people in admission in higher educational institutes and they are given reservation in government jobs as well, okay? So that has been the root of the caste system. And the thing is like, what is the larger viewpoint? What is the larger picture? The larger picture is like, we want to end, right? The society want to end, we want to end the caste system. What? We want to end the caste system. Why we want to end the caste system? We want to end the caste system so that everybody in this society can be treated equally. Because one of the constitutional principle is equality. And we do have right to equality, right to fair treatment, right to be treated well. And for that, those people who have been historically subjugated, those people whose rights have been curtailed, historically. So we have come up with reservation policies, we have come up with affirmative actions so that they can be also uplifted in the society. They can also, let's say, get the same status in the society as other people in the society, right? For that, like, you know, the larger picture is we want to eradi eradicate the caste system. Now the question arises that, like, nowadays, if political parties are demanding a caste census, right? what political parties are demanding, they are demanding caste census. 
so is that demand right or not so that's the question that like you know these articles try to answer so when we talk about this caste census right caste census like you know now the topic is caste census what do we mean by census census is in hindi known as jan ganna means it is the exercise of counting the population in a country so when we do caste census so we want to count the population in the country caste wise i mean like in this caste how many people are there in that caste how many people are there in 2011 when in 2011 the government of india has conducted something known as socio economic and caste census as part of the socio economic and caste census people have reported around 46 lakh how many 46 lakh castes caste sub caste and all if you ask any person he will say i am mahar you will ask a person he will say ki i am uh, this thing i am matlab uh, like that so there are 46 lakh like caste sub caste in the country but the thing is like do we have any codified rule do we have any codified norm that talk about these are the caste in the society so the thing is like you know if we talk about the caste as a topic right in the uh, like the central government has created a list that list actually categorizes people into different caste one of the caste is known as let's say scheduled caste other is known as scheduled tribes right then they have categorized as other backward classes okay other backward classes then those people who who do not get reservation they are called as open category people or they are categorized as general people so the thing is the scheduled caste are those people who are given reservation by the government in admission in academic institutions for their admissions in uh, for their let's say uh, like reservation in government jobs also for scheduled tribes also there is a difference between scheduled caste and scheduled tribes what is the basic difference scheduled caste are those people like who are lower caste people according to the varna system in the varna system those people who are doing the mean, uh, manual labor work right i mean like who are involved into cleaning activities and all so they are categorized as scheduled caste people so they are lower caste people right then we have scheduled tribes scheduled tribes are generally those people who are considered to be ab original people they are known as adivasi we know hindi word adivasi so they are known as scheduled tribes and if we talk about other backward classes other backward classes means this is an umbrella term that includes people from backward classes from different caste groups i mean like someone who is uh, uh, let's say like you know a cobbler maybe a person who is making pottery so different kind of people are included into the other backward classes this is not the case that only muslims are part of other backward classes it's not the thing it's about what occupation people do right so in history also if we talk about historically the people can move from one caste to another caste it's not a birth uh, like you know birth right or it's not a thing that the caste will remain same with the person throughout his life a person who is uh, let's say into vaishyas he can move into shudras also he can move into brahmins as well provided what activity he is doing in the society so in the historical past in ancient india also there was let's say this system that people can move from one caste to another caste by adopting different set of occupation people can adopt different occupation in their own life so the thing is like government of india has created let's say like these categories so central government maintains a list of people who are scheduled caste uh, scheduled tribe and other backward classes and different state governments also have their own uh, let's say like you know set of these things like these people belong to these caste okay like that so if we talk about the caste census that was conducted by the government in 2011 in that caste census in that socio economic caste census they have identified huge number of caste and that's why they did not release the data they did not release the op uh, data in open that like these people belong to these caste but there have been many commissions also that have been set up by the government to talk about like what reservation can be given one of the commission is known as mandal commission so mandal commission has been set up by the government in 1996 around so mandal commission has thought said that 27% reservation should be given to other backward classes right mandal commission said so now at this point of time different parties and especially the opposition parties and parties who are in different state governments they are demanding a caste census to be conducted throughout india 
And recently, the Bihar government has conducted a caste census. And in that caste census, actually, they have identified that 87% of the people, right? 87% of the people in Bihar belong to two categories. One is extremely backward classes plus other backward classes, OK? It is 63%. Maybe. I mean, like, you know, so basically, they have identified people from these backward classes include 87 percent. So it may be extremely backward classes is around 36 percent. Right? It is around 36.01. Huh? Hmm. No, no. Overall, it is 67 percent. But maybe these two are 63 percent. There can be another caste group also. Maybe STs plus SCs like that. Okay, so in all the total reservation, I mean like total people who are into the backward classes in, in the state of Bihar, so they have, let's say, come up with a new category, which is known as extremely backward classes. What? They have come up with this, extremely backward classes. What? Extremely backward classes. So they have come up with this thing, which is known as EBCs, right? So Bihar government has come up with this thing. They have conducted the caste census. And caste census has been conducted by a government which is ruling in Bihar. I mean, like, you know, Nitish Kumar and his party, like, you know, they have uh, done this particular thing. However, this caste census has been opposed by the central government. Central government says only the central government has the right to conduct a caste census in India according to the constitution of India, according to the laws that are mentioned. However, the Patna High Court, I mean like, you know, Patna High Court has upheld the cause of the Bihar government. Yes. And also in the Supreme Court of India, Supreme Court of India has decided not to stay this particular thing. Okay, so they have allowed the release of the uh, data from here. I mean data which is non-sensitive, non-personal. The aggregated data, like what uh, proportion of people belong to which caste group, right? So this has been released. But the thing is like why different parties are demanding this particular thing, a caste census. Parties are saying that if we have a caste census, we will be knowing that what composition of the population constitutes which caste group. And accordingly, we can come up with government policies that can uplift the people who are from the backward classes, who are from the, let's say, lower classes in the society. So this is the demand of those people who, let's say, are talking about having a caste census, who are pro-caste census thing. But those people who are saying, let's say, like, we do not need a caste census, they say that, like, you know, if we conduct a caste census, so the thing is, the issue of caste is going to get ingrained into the society. And we will not be able to eradicate the caste. And recently, the Prime Minister Modi, he has said, I mean, like, in a political rally, he said, like, you know, I don't want any caste to be conducted. I consider all the poor people belong to one caste. And I want to uplift all those people. However, the opposition parties are saying that the ruling party or party of the, let's say, like, you know, Prime Minister Modi, so they are only functioning for some of their elite friends, right now, from the corporates. So they say, like, uh, this person, that person, you know, Adani, Ambani, and all, they are, uh, like, for them it is done. I mean, like, it is deeply political, societal issue. Means like it has many things. But the thing is like, you know, people are demanding a caste census. Now, if we talk about this article, like we have understood about the background of this topic, it says the politics of a caste census, its impact on secularism. Okay. So if we talk about secularism, the word secular is a part of the constitution of India. It is mentioned in the preamble of the constitution of India. Okay. So if we read the preamble, it says we the people of India having solemnly, uh, like, let's say, having solemnly resolved to constitute India into a social, secular, democratic, republic, sovereign, like that. So this secular word is there in the preamble of the constitution. Now, if we talk about secular, right? If we talk about the concept of secularism, okay? So this concept of secularism is also a very important one, okay? So let's discuss about this. Secularism. So, if we talk about secularism, there are two connotations related to secularism. One of the connotation is known as positive connotation of secularism. Other is known as negative connotation of secularism. 
positive connotation of secularism means the state and okay the state and religions okay will coexist like that okay coexist there can be let's say uh, like you know participation of the state in religious affairs means like you know some of the arenas in india we follow this particular concept which is positive concept of secularism if we talk about some other countries if you talk about the example of france so france adopts what negative connotation of secularism they say that state and religion will be separate from one another means there is separation of okay separation of of state and religion they say if people want to uh, if people want to let's say practice their religions they have to practice it in their home they have to practice it in non uh, public life i mean they have to practice it in their pub, uh, uh, like personal spheres but in india we have adopted the concept of positive concept of secularism means the state will maintain equal distance from all religions and at the same time it will consider all religions to be equal for example in india we do have many people from many religious communities like we have hindus we have muslims we have christians we have uh, people who follow judaism then we have sikhism we have jainism we have buddhism right and also we have anglo indians in india who follow many people follow christianity as well right so that's the thing so in india people fo follow different religion thing and also let's say like you know in official spheres also you you may identify many politicians going to the parliament of india wearing religious thing from all religion i'm not saying just one religion if you talk about yogi adityanath he'll go in kurta if you talk about like you know asaduddin obviously he'll go in i mean like you know people are going into the public sphere not only in public sphere in the parliament of india wearing religious symbols like that why because it is not prohibited in india we adopt a positive connotation of secularism like that so this is the thing now this concept of secularism now it is in this article they are saying that the poly, the politics of a caste census its impact on secularism now if we conduct a caste census we will be able to identify how many people belong to which caste and this will lead to us to identify how many people belong to which religion so if that that thing is done so like you know these political parties the i mean people from different political let's say like you know domination they will try to garner vote banks by coming up with different set of let's say like you know uh their policies initially let's say manifesto of their party like that so it is going to let's say divide the country into the different things so in this article they have talked about what are the politics that are associated with this they have talked about like what impact it can have on the secularism in the country but the thing is like you know india is a deeply secular country i mean like you know since time immemorial all the caste religions have let's say coexisted together and it is still the fabric of the country like we talk about unity in diversity means like we do have diversity we have religious diversity linguistic diversity we have diversity in terms of let's say income groups and all but still people are coexisting together that's the thing so this article if you read right it says a caste census could trigger a process of social engineering that could upset hindutva's apple cart of hindu majoritarian unity okay it says that the larger thing i mean like you know the present party which is in power so they garner the vote bank of the hindu majorities so if we conduct a caste census and if we have data of caste census from across india so it will trigger a process of social engineering what do we mean by social engineering means coming up with policies that are targeted towards a specific religious group that are targeted towards a specific caste group which is going to benefit one caste group not benefit other caste group like that so it's known as social engineering right so this social engineering could upset hindutva's apple cart of hindu majoritarian unity that's what the author is saying i hope this topic is clear right so we will move to another topic with this now this is another topic this is also an important topic it says not just a case about improving investigation okay so we will understand this topic in detail let's be quick in this name of the topic is uh 
about improving investigation. not just a case about improving investigation. Now we need to understand, like if we talk about the keyword investigation, right? If we talk about the keyword investigation. This keyword is deeply rooted in how our criminal justice system functions in the country. What? Criminal justice system. Criminal justice system. Right? Now, what do we mean by criminal justice system? Now, if we talk about criminal justice system, like, you know, long back in India, if we talk about this Manu Smriti, right? Manu Smriti. This Manu Smriti is considered to be the first law book in the country. It talks about, it not only talks about, let's say, like, caste, varnas and all. It also talks about criminal justice system, means like how, uh, like you know this, uh, like if a person does any crime, how he has to be punished, what fine can be applied, right? So the crimes that people do can be of various nature. One of the crime can be considered to be a civil nature, civil crime, okay, civil nature, or other can be considered as criminal nature. Okay, criminal nature. If we talk about civil nature crime, the crimes associated with money. For example, somebody has taken some loan from someone and that person is not repaying. It's a crime, but it's not a criminal offense. It's let's say a civil offense. Okay, it can, uh, there can be a civil suit that can be initiated against a person. Okay, things related to money laundering. What if we talk about in today's term, if we talk about money laundering, that's a crime of civil nature. And if we talk about family disputes, there is a family, husband, wife, children, husband, wife are fighting with one another. They file cases into the court, like they apply for divorce and all. So the thing is, there is a dispute between people, but it's not of a criminal nature. It can turn into criminal nature if there is a physical violence, if there is coercion, if there is threat to life, something like that, okay? That can assume criminal nature. But like, you know, this family related things, what? Family dispute are what? Civil crimes. Similarly, let's say dispute related to execution of contract between two parties. There can be an organization, there can be another organization, they might have some, sign some contract between them, one of the parties not ab abiding with the terms of the contract. So in that case also, what? Civil, Civil right? Contractual obligation, okay? Contract, actual breach, obligation breach. I'm just writing these things to make you understand what can be different crimes. Other is crimes of criminal nature. Crimes of criminal nature means somebody has, let's say, done a theft. Theft is a criminal crime. Dacoity is a criminal crime. Killing a person is a criminal crime. Rape is a heinous uh, criminal crime like that. Okay. So, something related to killing offenses. Like these are, let's say, if we talk about the criminal justice system, if we talk about CRPC, IPC, they talk about offenses against human, offenses against individual. I mean, like if you confine a person in a certain boundary, if you do not let him to move freely, that's also a criminal crime. If you are killing someone, I mean like, you know, your offenses against the body, offenses against an individual, then there can be offenses against the state. For example, uh, like, you know, uh, if you raise slogans, anti-India slogans and all, so that will be offenses against the uh, state. Then offenses, many other offenses that are prohibited, so they can be criminal nature thing, okay, they can be criminal nature thing. But the thing is, the kind of criminal justice system that we follow now, the criminal justice system has not evolved since the independence or since the present government came up with the bills. The thing is, this criminal justice system has been part of Indian tradition. 
not only in India, in other countries elsewhere also they do have criminal justice system. So the thing is their roots are historically there. I mean like every kingdom that ruled, they also had a kind of let's say like head uh, like in their own what we say like council right in their member of council there was a person he was known as uh, like dandanya like you know something related to this adhikari dand related adhikari okay dandapalika like that niyay palika so they used to have this thing like during the akbar rule also like we have seen about this thing so the criminal justice system has been part of indian society it is still the part but the thing is the government of india has adopted the criminal justice system that has been codified by the britishers when they were ruling on india so which laws let's say like you know we are following now presently we are following what if we talk about criminal laws in india right if we talk about criminal laws in india now we have let's say indian penal code IPC, we have Code of Criminal Procedure, which is known as CRPC. Then we have Indian Evidence Act, right? I am just writing Indian Evidence Act. So these are the, let's say, laws, criminal laws that we are following presently. However, the present government has come up with three criminal laws. One is known as Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita. Other is known as Bharatiya Nagrik Suraksha Sahita. Then third is known as Bharatiya Sakshya, right? So these are the laws that the present government has come up with. But they are, these are just bills now. They have been introduced into the parliament. They have not been passed. They are bills. Once these bills become acts, they want to replace the, like through Bharatiya Nyaya Sahita, they want to replace the Indian Penal Code. Through the Bharatiya Nagrik Suraksha Sahita, they want to replace the Criminal Procedure Code. Through the Bharatiya Sakshya, they want to replace the Indian Evidence Act. This is the thing. But in this article, the author has not talked about this thing. Like this was the background to understand what is criminal justice system, right? Now here, if you talk about criminal justice system, let's say there is an individual and there are laws in the country. Right? There are laws. For example, this is a country, country may be, let's say, country A or in this case, we are talking about India. Let's talk about India. So in India, we have codified laws, laws that are written, right? And a person can be, let's say, violative of some of the laws. They can, he can be violative of some civil procedure code. He can be violative of criminal procedure code. If a person violates any of the laws, if a person, what, violates any of the laws, then the thing is, the criminal justice system, the criminal justice system in the country, right, criminal justice system in the country is going to try that person, is going to, let's say, like, you know, apply these laws against that person. It is not needed that a person is aware which laws are in India. It is not needed. Means I am a citizen, I have not studied any law, I have not heard about anything. But as part of the society, I am part of this society. So the thing is like in India, we already have this like, you know, a system in place. We have a constitutional democracy. We do, we are a democratic country. We do have a constitution. We have these things. I am part of the society. As part of the society, there is kind of uh, thing which is known as tacit consent. What? There is a consent which is known as tacit consent. It says, even if you are unaware that you are violating any law, but actually if you violate, if you do something that violates an existing law, then it can be uh, like, you know, you can be penalized for it, right? This is the thing. So here an individual can be, let's say like, you know, at contradiction with law, he might have violated some law. In that case, the criminal justice system has the responsibility of punishing that person. It has the responsibility, but the criminal justice system has to be fair with that person also. It has to be fair with the person on whom it is applying these laws. How it can be fair? By conducting an impartial and transparent investigation, okay? So investigation becomes an important part. What? Investigation becomes an important part. 
if we conduct an investigation, we will be able to identify which laws he has violated. Let's say like, you know, uh, th this particular person, he has committed some crime and we are conducting a, an investigation. We will come to know that under law one, he has violated, let's say, part one. Under law two, he, ha he has violated part two. Under law three, he has violated part, let's say, like, you know, part four, maybe. Let's say like, you know, under these things. So what will be the maximum punishment? These punishments are also mentioned. Means like if we read the Indian Penal Code, in the Indian Penal Code, they have mentioned what constitutes a violation and then what will be the punishment for it. They mention about it. Criminal Procedure Code says like what steps to be followed to ascertain that this person has violated this law. Right, that's the thing. So we will identify what like you know what rules he has violated and all the punishments like you know that are there the judges have to ascertain whether he has to be given maximum punishment or least punishment or in between it is left up to the judges up to the criminal justice system so they will add all of it and they will apply these things against the person so it demands a kind of independent and impartial investigation against that person but the thing is, in this article, the author has talked about that the investigation that is being done in India, these investigations are not pointing towards a single direction. I mean, like, you know, there is ambiguity. Ambiguity not only in the law books, but there is ambiguity in the way how the judges or how different courts are interpreting the violation under different things. I mean, like, you know, so in this article, the author has given many examples of court cases. Many examples of the cases in which the Supreme Court of India has given judgment, okay? So those case laws are mentioned. What? Case laws are mentioned. What are the case laws that they have mentioned? I'm just going to write down these laws, right, for you quickly, okay? So they have mentioned many case laws. One of the case laws that, that they have mentioned is Rajesh and another versus state of Madhya Pradesh, okay? What? Rajesh and A and R means another versus state of Madhya Pradesh. So this is one of the case in which the Supreme Court of India has, let's say, talked about that because of proper data from the investigation, in our criminal justice system, it is assumed that if a person is not held guilty by a court of law, till that time he will be presumed to be innocent. I mean like a court of law has to, uh, let's say like, you know, hold that this person is convicted of anything, uh, only then like he will be punished for that thing. Un until then, that person is presumed or assumed to be innocent. So the thing is, while a kind of investigation is also going on, he will not be presumed guilty, he will not be presumed to be an accused. So the thing is, in this particular case, the Supreme Court of India has said that like, you know, over here, the Supreme Court of India has said that people have been acquitted. Acquitted means like they have been, uh, let's say, they have been cleaned of all the charges against them. Acquittal means like, you know, leaving that person free, right? Uh, this is the thing. So Supreme Court of India said that acquittal has been done because proper data was not available related to investigation and there were illegal procedure process that people have followed while doing the investigation okay so that has been the case in this case also recently two days back another case came i mean like i have read in the hindu also and that time when this case has assumed height i'm like in noida what has happened like you know deet and nithari you might have heard about that nithari case like in a particular house, in the compound of that house, people have identified, people have found carcasses or skeletons of many children in the house. Around 28, 30 children's skeletons have been found inside that house. And two people have been taken into custody. There have been investigation for a long time against them. Courts have, let's say, uh, like, you know, given, what we say, courts have, uh, like, you know, given sentence to them. Those people have been in jail. But recently, Allahabad High Court, I mean like, you know, uh, Noida is part of UP. So Allahabad High Court has acquitted both the people. That like, you know, we do not have credible data from the investigation. And like, you know, the investigation is not fair and uh, this thing. So because of lack of data, those people have been acquitted. 
So recently, the Supreme Court of India said that because of, let's say, uncertain data, people are acquitted and maybe culprits are roaming free in the society. So we need to have proper investigation mechanism. But in this article, the author has said, not just a case about improving investigation, but the thing is like the case laws where the Supreme Court of India or different high courts in India have given judgment, they are also very ambiguous. They take different stands at different points. So here they have talked about, uh, like, you know, about a committee, which is Justice Malimath uh, Committee on Reforms. Okay, they have talked about what? Justice Malimath Committee. Okay, so this is the heading of the, let's say, like today's thumbnail as well. Justice Malimath Committee on Reforms of Criminal Justice System on reforms of criminal justice system criminal justice system so this justice malimath committee this committee was set up by the central government nda government in 2000 right in the year of 2000 and this committee has given a lot of recommendation related to improving the criminal justice system in India. It has talk, talked about how the investigation has to be done. It has also talked about setting up of an independent committee, independent police commission, okay? So that the police or law enforcement agencies, they should not work under political pressures. So Justice Malimath Commission has talked about that there should be an independent committee, uh, commission. That commission should oversee the, let's say like, you know, functioning of the investigation and other thing. So they say that the, uh, in that case, the law enforcement agencies will not be working under the pressure of the political parties. They will not be working under political pressures and we will be able to reform the criminal justice system in India. Apart from this, the Justice Malimath Committee also has talked about that whenever a person does any crime for which the maximum punishment is death sentence. So instead of giving death sentence, that should be converted into life imprisonment without any remission. Remission means like, you know, reducing the sentence, okay? So they have talked about that, like, you know, death sentence should, like, they say, like, even if you do not take away the death sentence from the rule books in India, but that death sentence can be converted into life imprisonment. So the Justice Malimath Committee has given 20 point recommendations. The report that is given by Justice Malimath Committee has more than 300 pages, 381 pages. So they have talked about, let's say, huge overhaul of the criminal justice system. And recently, the Supreme Court of India has also talked about, okay, Supreme Court of India has also talked about, uh, like this Justice Malimath Committee reforms on criminal justice system. Are we understanding this thing? Okay, this is the thing. So in this article, they have discussed about this, like many other case laws have been talked about. Thank you. So many other case related things have been mentioned in this article. So they have said, in this article they have talked about like investigation related things also, like judiciary itself has not followed a kind of its own precedence. Precedence means if you give a judgment on in any case, that judgment will be followed by other courts also. But you keep different, you give different, let's say interpretations to the same thing in different cases. So the thing is like it is not setting any, let's say predictable pre, 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 uh, like, you know, precedence for people. So that's the thing. So in this article, the author has talked about, author is a former IPS officer. He has talked about many cases and reading these cases becomes very difficult. He has talked about conflicting, conflicting interpretations by the top court are also the cause of confusion among investigating agencies. Okay, means con conflicting interpretations by the Supreme Court are also the cause of confusion among investigating agencies. That's the thing. So you need to read this article once again to understand the case laws that are mentioned, okay? So with this, like I have included some questions for you. You can go through these questions and you can answer these questions after writing these questions. You can share it with me at zahidul at lukmanias.com, okay? So these are the two questions, short questions. You need to write the answer in about 150 words, right? So having understood this, now we will move to another topic quickly. This is another topic, we'll be quick. It says, frosty ties. 
ordinary people will suffer as India and Canada cut down visa services. So the thing is presently what is happening on one side we have India, on the other side we have Canada. We have like you know good ties, historical ties with Canada, we have let's say like you know good relations, international relations with Canada. But recently what has happened, one person was killed in the soil of Canada. His name is some Nijjar. Right. And he was a pro-Khalistani people. Pro-Khalistani uh, pro uh, kha, person or like you know Khalistani activist. He was killed on the soil of Canada and since Canada is a democratic country, they follow the rule of law, they follow proper justice system and like you know, and Canada is a part of Five Eyes Alliance, okay. It is part of Five Eyes Alliance. So what is this Five Eyes Alliance? It's a kind of intelligence grouping in which Canada is a member. Canada, USA, Australia, I think like you know, UK. New Zealand, okay. So they are the members of the Five Eyes Alliance. So it is. it was a secret agency, secret investigative agency. This in agency has given input to Canada that like in the killing of Mr. Nijjar, there was, let's say like, you know, hand of Indian authorities. So it said that Indian authorities were involved in the killing of this thing. However, India has condemned about this disclosure. This, this thing was said by the Prime Minister of Canada. Justin uh, Trudeau. Soon after that, I mean, like Indian authorities have, uh, let's say, flooded with a lot of information that, like, you know, we condemn this thing, we are not involved in this thing. And recently, India has decided to, let's say, send back, so uh, from Canada, around 62 people, right? Uh, 62 diplomatic people are in India. Means, like, you know, they do have their diplomatic missions. Here we have their embassies. So, these people are there. So, India has decided to cut short this thing around 21%. So, India has said that take back all other people, just keep at most 21% in India so that we can maintain the relation. But the thing is, Canada government has said that this is a violation under the Geneva Convention, Vienna Convention on, uh, on Consular Relations, okay? There is a convention which is known as Vienna Convention on Consular Relations, okay? On Diplomatic Relations. So Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations talks about what diplomatic immunities have to be given to the embassy people, to the, let's say, diplomats who are stationed by one country to another country. They have said it is a... Uh, like you know violation of this thing however India has said it is not a violation even inside Vienna Convention there is a clause in this article they have mentioned about that clause and they have said like you know under this particular thing Vienna Convention's article 11.1 does authorize India to require that the size of the mission be kept within limits so India has talked about that there is a clause also there is an article inside the Vienna Convention that allows India to limit the this particular thing, I mean like, you know, number of people who are working here. So this is the case, I mean like, when we read further at a later time, we'll discuss about this, okay? Vienna Convention is an important thing. Then this is another topic. This topic is related to Gaganyaan mission. Gaganyaan is a human space flight mission of India. So as part of this mission, we want to send human being to the, uh, where? To the space. So basically, let's say this is the earth. This is the earth. And let's say this is the atmosphere. So at about 400 kilometer height, we want to send astronauts. Okay, we want to send uh, this particular spacecraft, which is known as Gaganyaan. So we want to send them in this orbit. They will stay in this orbit for some time. And after then they will come back. Initially, it was decided that we will send three people. But as of now, the Indian Space Research Organization has said that it is not clear how many people we are going to send. But as part of this mission, I mean like, you know, where human being will be sent. So we need to make it sure that the, uh, that the spacecraft that is going to carry human being, they are human rated. And at the same time, we want to conduct many tests also before sending the actual mission. One of the tests that ISRO has conducted today I am like ISRO on its official website, uh, YouTube channel, they have let's say live telecasted about this thing. This is known as test vehicle abort mission, okay. This is known as what? Test vehicle abort 
mission okay test vehicle about mission tvd1 so they are going to conduct about 3 to 4 uh, like you know they are going to conduct three test uh, like uh, three test vehicle about mission in this mission they have sent let's say a kind of similar spacecraft like this and this is spacecraft will have a crew module crew module means over here inside this there will be human beings and these human beings will be uh, let's say made to sit in a pressurized system because like if we talk about the surface of the earth on the top of the surface of the earth we have the atmosphere we do have that say pressure of all the molecules of the gases on us so we actually stay under huge pressure we have the highest amount of pressure on the surface of the earth if we go up the pressure keeps on reducing so these human beings will be kept inside a pressurized system and then they will be sent uh, let's say like you know to the thing and as of now the test vehicle that they have sent it does not have pressure system but they have uh, let's say tested that if something wrong happens in the mission how these people can abort the mission how these people can safely return to the surface of the earth so that thing has actually been demonstrated by isro today yes, yes now you ask decreasing how sir so it depends upon temperature as well pressure depends upon temperature as well lot of thing but the thing is like you know we need to understand this thing that let's say this is earth what this is earth and on the top of earth we have what atmosphere atmosphere has different layers one of the layer is known as troposphere we have a stratosphere we have mesosphere we have thermosphere and then we have exosphere so the thing is as we move up in the atmosphere the molecules of gases the gas molecules and other particles they become rarer i mean like here the density of molecules will be less here the density of molecules will be high there will be let's say little less than this one but like you know little more than this one like that so if we have lot of thing on us so the highest amount of pressure is going to be experienced by people who are on the surface of earth if you are here the pressure will be low that's why what happens if you go to the top of the mountain people start bleeding why because there is no pressure so that's why like you know a blood and other thing starts coming out of the system since we have let's say pressure so our system has adapted itself to stay under pressure okay so we have most pressure when we are on the surface of the earth if we move up the pressure keeps on reducing so this pressure is let's say uh, one atmospheric pressure okay one atm they say okay pressure is measured using a scale pascal so might have heard about this okay so this is the thing they have conducted a test mission they have uh, conducted this thing for uh, crew mission then there will be crew escape uh, system also and later on they are going to conduct other test also where they will be sending a humanoid robot which is known as vyom mitra you might have seen this vyom mitra earlier also it looks like human but it is a robot it it is able to speak also so they are going to do a test using that vyom mitra as well at a later date so in your free time you can see that video of isro where they have conducted the pad abort mission then this is another topic it says simultaneous poles lock a mission to meet panel so as we know that the central government has created an expert committee that expert committee is headed by former president of india mr ram nath kovind okay ram nath kovind is heading this particular commission and this expert level let's say like you know expert level commission or committee is going to look into the cause of one nation one election what it is going to look into it is going to look into the issue of one nation one election in india okay what do we mean by one nation one election it means we want to conduct election simultaneously for the lok sabha and also for the state legislative assemblies we want to conduct simultaneous election okay that's the thing however related to simultaneous election government of india has said why we want to conduct simultaneous election we want to conduct simultaneous election to reduce the cost right to reduce cost of election second thing is 
to be free from the process of election. I mean like after we conduct an election, we will be free. And then we will be uh, able to focus on governance, okay, to focus on governance like that. So for these reasons, government of India wants to conduct simultaneous election. However, there are many viewpoints that oppose simultaneous ele election. They say that like, you know, according to the present uh, form of the um, constitution, pre present form of conducting election, it is not possible because like it requires many constitutional amendments. Even Shashi Tharoor has pointed that it is not possible in the present thing we need to convert the parliamentary form of government to presidential form of government. That will be the easiest thing to conduct simultaneous elections in India. In USA, they do have simultaneous election. They conduct simultaneous election, yes. but they have a presidential system. So there have been articles also earlier that talked about specific articles of the constitution that needs to be amended. Okay. So now what is happening, this particular expert level body, okay, which is headed by Ramnath Kovind, former president of India. He is going to meet the chairperson of the Law Commission of India. Okay, so he is going to meet uh, Justice Rituraj Avasti, and they are going to discuss among themselves like how do we conduct the simultaneous elections in India. Okay, this is the thing. Okay, I hope it is clear. You can read about it. Means like there are many things that we can discuss, but since it's a short topic, so like we thought of covering it. Calcutta High Court says every female adolescent should control sexual urge. Now, it's also an important topic. Here what happens, those people who are above the age, right, who are above the age from 16 years to 18 years, those people who fall in this age group, 16 years to 18 years, they are known as adolescents, okay, Adol adolescents, okay, those people who are here. But in India, under the law, uh, like law books in India, we have something which is known as age of consent. The age at which persons can willingly enter into sexual relationship with other people. This is age of consent. This age of consent in 18 years in India. It is presently 18 years. And if we talk about a law which is known as Protection of Children from Sexual Offenses Act, okay, POXO. Protection of Children from Sexual Offenses Act. This POXO Act also does not have, let's say like, you know, according to POXO, I mean like, you know, they consider people below the age of 18 years to be children. But the court have recently, like, you know, the High Court, uh, Calcutta High Court recently has, let's say, take, uh, given a verdict in a case where, let's say like, you know, two people who were between the age of 16 and 18, they were involved in sexual activity. So the court had to take a decision because POXO Act considers it to be a criminal offense. If somebody does any sexual activity with a person below the age of 18 years. But the thing is, in this case, the uh, Calcutta High Court has acquitted that person. Calcutta High Court has talked about, he, uh, Calcutta High Court has talked about decriminalization. What? Decriminalization. Okay, it had talked about decriminalization of uh, uh, like consensual, uh, like act of consensual sex between uh, like, uh, like in, in the people who are in, in this particular age group. That's the thing. So what you need to do after reading this article, we have understood what is the case. You need to read about protection of children from sexual offenses act. So this act is a gender neutral act, means it considers all people uh, below the age of 18 years to be minors. And the thing is, if any kind of force or coerced sexual activity is involved, so the thing is, it is equated with rape. It can be against a boy, it can be against a girl also. So you need to go through this act. It has been in news many a times, right? So we need to read about this. So having understood this, there is another topic. It says missed opportunity, okay? HDI, HDI means Human Development Index. HDI of indigenous peoples must be, uh, must be kept, must, be, uh, must keep pace with those of the Australians. Now, this topic is very important topic. We'll just be quick, okay? So I'm not going to write down the name of the topic. So here we are talking about the case related to Australia. 
right? We know where is Australia located. Australia is a continent. It's a continent. So in Australia, there is a case related to aboriginals, right? Who are aboriginal people? Aboriginals are known as Adivasi people. Those people who have stayed in Australia for more than 6,000 years, right? They are originals, aboriginal people. And then in Australia, there are people who came, who migrated from somewhere else, right? Who migrated from somewhere else to Australia. But these people who have migrated to Australia, they have, let's say, like, you know, settled down in the mainland Australia. These people have received most of the constitutional rights in Australia. But in Australia, they do have a direct democracy. What they have? They have something which is known as direct democracy. In direct democracy, if they want to make any changes into the constitution, they have to follow something which is known as what? Referendum. So, they have recently, uh, let's say like, you know, conducted a voting uh, exercise in which all the citizens of Australia have to vote. And Australian government has made voting to be a mandatory exercise. So Australia is the only country in the world where we see highest participation of people into the voting exercise. People have voted, uh, let's say, more than 90% in their general elections. That's uh, like, you know, for lawmaking thing. Okay, people are aware about voting thing. But the referendum that they have moved, right? This referendum was related to establishment of a voice. What? A voice. What do we mean by voice? They wanted to establish an advisory body. What? Advisory body. Advisory body to the Parliament of Australia. This advisory body would advise about the laws that are needed for the aboriginal people. Laws that are needed for these people. However, this referendum has failed. Means like 40% people said yes. 60% people said no. That's the thing. Okay. So, in this article they have said that although this referendum has failed, but there is a larger need of sensitization and gen awareness generation among the people so that people understand about what is the need of the aboriginal people. These aboriginal people have, let's say like, you know, lesser life expect expectancy as compared to those people who have migrated to Australia. These people have life expect expectancy, let's say like 70 years to 80 years like that. And this is, let's say like, you know, around 10 to 15 years less than them. It is, let's say, 60 to 70 years. So these, this article says, human development index needs a relook in Australia. For that, they need to go for a kind of voting process. I mean, like, you know, so they have talked about Albanese people, like, you know, minute things are mentioned. If you read this article after this discussion, you will be able to understand. And this is the last article that we are going to discuss. This article says, no political strings in our support. She to Sri Lanka. So here, this article is related to China and Sri Lanka. <coughs> so as we know that Sri Lanka is going through a financial stress. Recently, the currency of Sri Lanka has devaluated to a greater extent. And because of instable political system also in Sri Lanka, they have faced balance of payment crisis. This is known as BOP crisis, right? They have faced balance of payment crisis. And in their balance of payment crisis, the International Monetary Fund, IMF has come to rescue to Sri Lanka. So it has, let's say, extended its support to Sri Lanka. It has said like, we are going to support you, we are going to help you, provided you fulfill these conditionalities. So IMF, whenever it helps any country, it also gives some kind of conditionalities to that country. For example, India also faced balance of payment crisis in 1991. When we faced balance of payment crisis, we have also got support from International Monetary Fund. And they have asked us to do a restructuring of our economy. They have asked us to go for privatization, liberalization, and globalization. So these are known as LPG reforms. We have also followed this thing. 
So in Sri Lanka, the IMF has, let's say, extended the first transe of, let's say, support. Means like if it has to give this much money, they have given, let's say, one fourth of the money to Sri Lanka. They have said, you bring this reform, then we are going to release the next set of money. But Sri Lanka does maintain good, rela good relation with India and also with China. China has built some ports also in Sri Lanka, okay. But recently the Prime Minister of Sri Lanka, Mr. Vikram Singhe, okay, Ranil Vikram Singhe, he has visited China. Why he has visited China? Because China is conducting one belt, one road initiative summit, okay, which is known as uh, like one belt, one road initiative summit, okay, belt and road uh, thing, initiative. So in that meeting, uh, like, you know, so there were official statements released. In that official statement, Chinese government has said that we are willing to support Sri Lanka the way that we have supported earlier, but we do not demand any political considerations in return. Means this is a unilateral support that we are providing to Sri Lanka. You understanding? So the thing is, so that Sri Lanka feels it easy to accept those, uh, let's say, help from China. That's the thing. So this is all about this article. Okay. So is it understood this topic? Yes. Okay. So that's all in our discussion for the day. Thank you so much everyone for attending today's session. I hope you have a good day ahead. Thank you.